Hi everybody, Grandad here again. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the geology of Shropshire. Now, as I've already said, Shropshire is a wonderful place to study geology. And uh, there's a great many of the rocks in Shropshire cover a vast area of time. And probably uh, Shropshire is the best place to come and study uh, geology because of its uh, abundance of uh, rocks from the uh, many geological periods. Now, the Earth is about 4.6 million years old. Um, and although we haven't got rocks from that age, uh, when the Earth began, it's, it's business of churning and whirling about and moving about plates on the Earth, tectonic plates, which we talked about. Um, but in Shropshire, it's quite unique in the fact that uh, you can study, uh, I, I think there's about a, a 13 or so, 14 perhaps more, geological periods. And at least 11 of those periods can be studied and you can find rocks in Shropshire related to that. And now, for a small county, which Shropshire is not a big county really, um, to be able to look at rocks from all those periods and study the geology of those times in one single county is remarkable and people have been coming to Shropshire from all over the world to study the rocks and as I've already said the great Victorians they studied rocks in the area and uh, classified rocks and they still use the names that those pioneers gave to rocks uh, and uh, geological time periods Now I've got a book here which if anyone's uh, interested in Shropshire geology I highly recommend that you try and get hold of this book I don't know whether it's still in print but I hope it is because it's a remarkable book and it's about the only one I know that really covers an in-depth view of Shropshire geology and how it fits in with the rest of the world now I showed you a book before by this chap um, Peter Toghill now he wrote a, the book which I showed before which is on the whole of England's geology. This is another book he, he's written, and it's on the geology of Shropshire. Now, it's a very interesting book, and I, I've looked at this a lot and studied it, but it is quite in-depth. Um, and if you want to know about Shropshire's geology, um, an in-depth view of it, and you can understand some of the technical terms and geological times and periods and different stratas and different ways of looking at things then this book re is a must you must really try and get hold of this book and read it and then you really will get into and understand the geology of Shropshire now as I've said the uh, the earth's about 4.6 million years old as it states in this book uh, and for a lot of that time there was no life on earth now the way they classify different periods of geological time is mainly by the fossils. Now I can't overestimate, uh, emphasize the importance of fossils in geology because uh, I mean you can find minerals but you can't really tell how old those minerals are. It's the fossils that you sometimes find in association with those minerals on those rocks uh, which actually defines the age of a rock. In, in other words, if you find very primitive creatures within those rocks, uh, then you know roughly how old they are. And because of the fossil record is extremely important in geology. Now, for the first, I don't know, 570 million years, uh, what's known as the Precambrian period, there weren't any fossils because life on Earth hadn't really kicked off yet. Uh, and in that time, the Earth was a very different place to what we see today. We know that it was splitting apart and forming different continents. And there was a lot of volcanic activity and earthquakes and a lot of rocks were being built uh, into mountains like the Himalayas. And even in England, there were mountains being built. And then gradually those mountains were eroded away by wind and rain uh, forces which eroded those uh, rocks down to form sedimentary rocks in the sea. And then uh, gradually, eventually, at the end of that sort of period, uh, 
creatures started to appear in the sea. Very primitive creatures, and I'll show you some very primitive creatures shortly, that uh, came to be in those seas and then eventually developed into creatures that came out. Uh, plants were, were formed, uh, growing in those seas, and eventually they occupied the land and changed the atmosphere. Uh, at that time, the atmosphere would, would not have had as much oxygen as it does today. Uh, but they changed the, the photosynthesis of plants, changed the oxygen, uh, uh, changed uh, the, the atmosphere to have more oxygen in it, which enabled life to get going. Uh, very strange life, <laughs> uh, the early life, but uh, it got going and eventually uh, leading towards uh, different creatures that, that evolved. Now we'll look at those in more detail as we go along, but what I wanted to focus on this this little episode that I want to show on now is the uh, the early rocks. Now the the very earliest rock formed that we can find a record of in Shropshire is uh, uh, a metamorphic uh, rock, uh, which has come about uh, from presumably sort of sediments or ground down rocks. Um, which was subducted underneath the earth and then squeezed at very high temperatures. Because when you get a lot of rock on top of other rocks, the pressure that builds up and the heat that builds up produces what they call metamorphic rocks, which are rocks that have been changed by heat and pressure. Now, within those rocks, as they, they, they cool down, crystals form and other minerals form. And that's how the mineralization of rocks really comes about by uh, rocks being altered by heat and pressure. In a metamorphic type situation and there's one rock uh, that's found in Shropshire uh, in an area of uh, what's known as the Rekin. Now the Rekin is a mountain which looks very much like a volcano. Uh, in fact it is mainly uh, consists of volcanic rocks which I'll show you a few in a moment. Um, but just to the one side of that there's an area uh, oh, a little town by the name of Rushton and there they found rocks in a very small area and I haven't I haven't got an example of those rocks I've only ever seen it in a museum but that rock is uh, said to be the oldest rock in Shropshire and it's a metamorphic rock and it contains all sorts of strange minerals uh, I mean it contains garnets micas uh, and it, it's known as a schist and it's known as the Rushton schist and it also appears at a place called Primrose Hill, which is a nice, uh, 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 another rock, which is called Genice. It's got a G at the beginning, it's nice. Uh, and schists. Now up in Scotland they have uh, sh uh, schists, which are really pretty rocks with garnets in. And they get the garnets in those grow quite big. But in the Rushton schist uh, that we have in Shropshire here, uh, you really need a microscope. Uh, to be able to see the garnets and the other minerals that are contained in the Rushton schist. And as I say, I haven't got a sample of it. I wish I did have, but uh, circumstances were that uh, when I was looking at rocks and collecting rocks, uh, I wasn't able to find Rushton schist and my uh, rock collecting was cut short by illness and I wasn't able to go out, although I did try uh, on many occasions to try and find a small area of Rushton schist uh, so I can get a sample of it, but I wasn't lucky. But I have seen it in museums, and it it, it it doesn't a very interesting looking rock. In fact, most of the volcanic rocks which I've got here, which I will show you, aren't terribly interesting in, in colours. So uh, I'll uh, I'll mix in with this video some later materials of rocks, possibly a few minerals and fossils, uh, as we as we go on, merely to make this this video a little bit more interesting to look at, but. Uh, the rocks I am going to show you belong to rocks which I collected from the Longmind, which is in the uh, in the east, I think, of uh, Shropshire. I think it's the east. I sometimes get mixed up with <laughs> east, west, north and south, but uh, I think it's in the east uh, of Shropshire, uh, near a town called Wellington. And uh, if ever you visit, you'll uh, just ask anybody where the Reekin is uh, by Wellington and they'll point in the direction. It, it's a it's a very well known landmark. Uh, it's a hill basically on its own. Now the nearly the whole of that uh, particular mountain, because it is quite a high mountain, is consisting 
of volcanic ash. Now, when you go there and visit it, uh, you find several rocks in different quarries and, and areas around there. And it's quite easy to find. It's on the main road. There's no problem in finding it. I mean, some of the places are a bit difficult to get at from when I went because it was all open. Now they've started putting fences around some of these things because people get climbing on the rocks and it's a bit dangerous. So you might not find the rock so easy, but because it's scattered about all over the place, you haven't got to climb a mountain or go up a rock face to find it. You'll find it lying on the side of the road and in ditches and, and in areas like that. And it's quite easy to, to break off a sample if you want to take a sample away. I don't advocate that you smash away at uh, uh, rocks uh, too much because otherwise uh, the rocks won't be there for other people to see but uh, I've always collected rocks so I can't uh, grumble if other people want to be a rock hound and collect rocks because I, f I find them fascinating and although you, you see them in situ on a mountain it's nothing uh, I like more than knocking a bit off and taking it home so I can study it a bit more but if I show you this rock as closely as possible I don't know whether the light's terribly good but I'll try and show you but if you look at this rock try and get it more in the center of the camera uh, look at this rock you'll see it consists of a grayish sort of material and there's lumps all over it lumps and bumps now these may not show up very well on the camera but these lumps and bumps are actual individual rocks little ch uh, sheds of, of rock uh, some are black some are green and there's various colors and now this is what we would call a very coarse volcanic ash uh, and some of these big bigger lumps are what are referred to as volcanic bombs when uh, volcanoes spurted uh, their ash out into the atmosphere uh, some of these rocks were quite big i mean huge lumps of rock would be fired out into the into the atmosphere and they crash back to the earth uh, as sort of molten glassy lumps now inside this rock you can see there's quite coarse lumps of uh, material which uh, is sort of made up of volcanic bombs now in the same area you can find a slightly less coarse grained rock very close to it uh, now this one is the same material it's a volcanic ash but the pieces in it i don't know whether you can see that but the pieces that are in it are very much smaller in other words this is a fine-grained volcanic ash now this rock was found from the very same place as the coarse one but between the two layers of coarse and uh, fine there was an area of what looked like toffee and you could see that this band of toffee like material looks as if it flowed down now that is probably rhyolite now when volcanoes spurt out ash into the atmosphere it falls down and forms a, an ash layer but when actual lava flows out of a, a volcano it flows down and runs like water virtually running down the mountain now somehow between the time of the coarse grains being deposited and the fine grains being deposited, possibly from different volcanoes, a volcanic river flowed over the top of the one layer and isolated it from the finer grains of the second layer. Now that layering of rocks is probably rhyolite. Now I've got an example of rhyolite here. Now it didn't actually come from uh, the Rekin, but it, it, it demonstrates what I'm talking about. Now this rhyolite is sort of a pinky coloured stone. And I don't know whether you can see on camera there, but there's all lines going across that specimen all the way around it. And this is what we call in geological terms as flow banded rhyolite. And it's very pretty and sometimes it's cut into jewellery and things to show these bands of toffee like material that's flowed out of volcanoes and there's another uh, rock i've got here which is another type of uh, material which is found at the Rekin. i picked this up at the Rekin, and this also is probably uh, some sort of rhyolite i mean i did look up the name of it i'm not sure what it's called now and i don't think i can find it quickly so uh, I might not tell you what this is, 
you'd have to find out for yourself by uh, sort of researching no I'm not going to be able to find it and I don't want to search the book and waste up my video but this is another type of material which uh, came out of a volcano which may be a rhyolite but I think it's it may have been called andesite or something like that now the other thing you find on mountains and this is another rock which actually is called andesite and uh, I picked this off another mountain which is not in uh, the Reekin area but is in South Shropshire at a place called Caer Caradoc, which is a huge mountain by Church Stretton and on top of that mountain there's various rhyolites and uh, volcanic ashes and this one as you can see this really is as you can see a volcanic ash um, now this material didn't fall down from the sky after the explosion of the volcano this probably flowed out uh, and then because it was full of gas uh, gas particles the gas bubbles uh, formed in it and it was bubbling and fizzing and crackling and goodness knows what and you resulted in this honeycomb type of rock which they call andesite and all these little tiny holes in it and that is from Caer Caradoc, a very small outcrop on the mountain of Caer Caradoc. Incidentally Caer Caradoc was a one of these uh, ancient uh, uh, Iron Age hill forts. So if you ever come to Shropshire and visit South Shropshire, uh, Church Stretton area, uh, it's worth going up Caer Caradoc and having a look at the uh, ancient uh, Iron Age uh, hill fort, which is up there, as well as looking at the rocks for uh, minerals. Uh, there's great areas of, of rhyolite up there, pink coloured rhyolite. And uh, there's also fossils in the lower levels of that uh, mountain. So it's well worth a look. But on the top, you'll find these gas bubbles. Now, these are the gas bubbles that I say fill up with quartz um, uh, very often, or calcites or other minerals. And these, these little ossicles, the little holes, the little gas bubbles uh, will fill up eventually. Because all things, as you know, as I've said in the past, any any cavity in the earth, uh, the earth so clever that it... Uh, It'll fill that cavity with something, uh, some sort of crystal or, or mineral. Uh, and eventually, so you very often find these particular rocks have got all the gas bubbles filled up with other minerals. Um, now, another thing that's formed uh, in the rhyolite, which I found very interesting. And again, it's it's on, on the reeking, uh, is this rock. Now, if you look at this rock, you can see that uh, it's probably rhyolite again. It isn't so pretty coloured. But what I want to grow your attention to on this are these lumps. And on there, there's there's four lumps. Now, those lumps are actually blobs of rhyolite, which, uh, as the rhyolite was, was flowing along like toffee out of a volcano, it must have come to an area near water where the rhyolite flowed over the edge of a cliff and dripped into the water. And as it dripped into the water, these bubbles, these solid lumps of rock formed into a, a, a solid ball, rather like lead being dropped down a, a shaft to form lead, lead weights and things. Rhyolite formed the same. And I've got a single one here just to show you. That's the type of thing that they form. These round balls of rhyolite were probably cooled in a water that was up by where this was found in the Reekin. And if you look inside there, you'll see that it's hollow. There's a tiny cavity inside there. Now this, for all the world, although it's tiny, is a sort of geode. And even in this little rock here, uh, the crystals are trying to grow inside that, which must have been a molten bubble of, of uh, rhyolite. As it formed, it formed hard, and it was hollow inside, and so minerals were formed inside it. And you can find those uh, in, a, in a place uh, not easy to find. I had to search for it on the Reekin where you can find, uh, and they, they call them ossicles, which is strange, but that can be found on the Reekin as well. And there's another example of uh, flow banded rhyolite there. If you have a look, I don't know whether I brought this one, so I thought it might show up a little bit better. The actual lines which I'm referring to, the flow banding as this flowed down. And for all the world, it looks like a piece of toffee that you could you, you could almost feel you could eat that. Um, now, when, I, when I'm doing, I've been thinking about these uh, videos and trying to make them as interesting as possible. And uh, 
because uh, a lot of the rocks uh, aren't terribly pretty they haven't got a lot of colors or a lot of shape to them uh, and you need to study them to to understand all the different uh, technical terms they're not particularly pretty to look at so i thought what i'd do was rather than just talk about rocks in particular and then minerals on their own and fossils on their own i'd make the video so we talk a little bit about rocks we talk a little bit about minerals and a little bit about fossils just to make the video varying and interesting because one thing i don't want people to to, to, to come to the conclusion that geology is boring and uh, it's just all figures and maps and hypotheses and and different things i want it to be interesting so to that end Oh, incidentally, one rock I will show you uh, when I'm talking about as regards being pretty. This is a piece of uh, the Rekin uh, rock, which I was showing you, and it's a fine grained uh, volcanic ash. And it, it's got a slightly green tinge to it. Now, this was found in, in an area very close to where I found the volcanic ash, but it's got a very fine grain to it. And because it looked very fine grained, I thought I would uh, cut it through with a diamond saw. And polish the one surface now I don't know how well this camera is going to pick it up but uh, if you look on there you can see that that polished surface of this rock I don't want to get the light in an area that I'm hoping will show there perhaps that's better I don't know but uh, I've got it so shiny it's like a mirror uh, and I don't know whether it shows. Maybe the light flashing back and two over it will show it better. I don't know. I'm trying to give you as better, best to look. So even a rock which is volcanic ash, which when polished uh, and cut and polished, can can look really attractive. And I, I can understand why someone might want to uh, cut a piece of that and have it as a kitchen uh, slab in their kitchen or, or just an ornament or something. But of course, nobody does. But I did. <laughs> I cut it and polished it. Now we're talking about minerals in our other video and this one I'll, I'll do a little bit on minerals not as perhaps as much as before but I mentioned in that uh, the iron pyrite which is the uh, iron uh, the uh, uh, fool's gold as people call it and I mentioned there charcoal pyrite which is a copper pyrite. Now I've got a, a little lump here of uh, charcoal pyrite which I'll just show you and again I'm having problems with light but if you look on there, this is what they call peacock ore. And I'm hoping the light may just catch it so that you can see the pretty colours of this copper pyrite, which isn't mined as a copper mineral, as we looked at uh, the main mineral for copper is uh, malachite. And there are other minerals that have copper in them as well as, as azurite. And uh, I think there are others. But this, although it does contain copper, is a pyrite of copper and therefore it isn't really mined as lovely be beautiful purple and greens and colors on there just like a peacock's tail which is why they refer to this rock as peacock ore and it's a good rock to to uh, to collect and have in your yes, as a specimen and that's a rather nice piece and i mean this piece i think is a natural piece although sometimes when you go to shops and you buy peacock ore they've actually uh, it is the genuine mineral. Uh, don't be misled by the fact that it's uh, what I'm going to tell you. But it is the genuine mineral. But sometimes this mineral hasn't got the colours. But if you put acid on it, if you put acid on the surface of this rock, it will actually enhance and produce the colours which you can see here. Now, I think this is a natural piece that hasn't been treated by any acids or anything. But some of the ones you may find in shops may actually have been treated. Now, the snag with those are that the colours don't always last very long because it's, an, it's, it's been artificially put onto the rock. And so over a period of time, those colours may fade a little bit. But on this one, because it's a natural one, the colour is almost certainly to last forever. And that's peacock ore. Now, I was also telling you in the last video about a mineral that, uh, that was magnetic. And then I showed you a small piece of fluorite, which actually fluoresced. Now, I've got another, and I mentioned at the time, another mineral, which uh, fluoresces, which has another property, which we mentioned, which is radiation, radiation, a radioactive rock. 
Now I've got one here and if you look at this one on the back side of it at the moment we're looking at the back side of this mineral uh, is is a granite and this actually is a piece of granite from Dartmoor which is down in Cornwall area and uh, this particular rock is full of minerals uh, because this was a dike that was underneath the ground this was a volcanic sort of eruption underneath the ground that rose up but it didn't burst out of the top and at the cause of volcano it stayed as what they call a dike which is a large area it spread out underneath the ground it didn't come to the surface and then it, it had time to cool down very very slowly and as it cooled down minerals started to grow and if you look in this you can see there's whites and blacks and different colored minerals all all settled out or formed within this granite rock um, there's mica there's quartz there's calcite there's felspars uh, all sorts of strange and wonderful minerals are formed within this rock now the one thing about it is uh, which I, I want I mentioned to you is the radon gas that, they, that comes out of uh, granite rocks down in Cornwall that was a, a big worry because they thought people would get radiation sickness from the radon gas coming out. Now if I turn this rock over you'll be able to see that on this side of it, which I'm calling the front side but <laughs> it isn't really a back and front it's just on another surface, uh, there's a yellow material which looks a bit like powder. It almost looks as if somebody's painted it. It's very thin and under a microscope you'd probably see that it's crystals because everything forms crystals as you know but the interesting part about this mineral and I'll try again by switching the light off and turning the camera a little bit so that it's as dark as possible and turning our ultraviolet light on again and shining it onto this particular mineral I don't know I don't think it's dark enough I'm not sure that this is actually working which is a pity because when you put this mineral into the dark and shine this ultraviolet light onto it it turns from yellow to green now, I don't know how well that worked but if it didn't then you'll just have to take my word for it in normal light this looks yellow as it does on the camera now I'm sure but when the ultraviolet light shines on it it turns green it fluoresces with a green hue now I've never had it tested myself with a Geiger counter because unfortunately I haven't got a Geiger counter I wish I had because I've got one or two uh, minerals which I know are radioactive and I can't test them for radiation. If I had one, I'd show it to you and you'd hear it clicking away like mad. But this mineral clicks like mad, apparently, when you bring a Geiger counter close to it because it's radioactive. Now, this piece in a bag and close to me now and in my shed, it's really not dangerous. I mean, you'd have to have this close to your body and sleep with it for years <laughs> before it would do anything to you, I'm sure. So it's perfectly safe uh, to actually own that. But it, it's not easy to find. I mean, I have to search a quarry for hours to find that specimen of uh, radioactive material. And for the life of me, I can't, in my stupid way, I can't remember all the names of these things. But it has got a name. And I'm sure if you look in uh, various books on geology, you'll find the name of what that mineral actually is. But it's interesting. Now, I thought we'd now go on to look at... Uh, as I say, the, the geological record started really uh, the time periods when you had these old rocks. And that lasted for millions of years, uh, uh, up until the time when life started to evolve on the Earth. It was a long time. I mean, the, the Earth went through massive amounts of changes. And most of the, the actual time of the Earth's existence there was nothing living on the earth at all. Uh, it wasn't until the seas appeared. Uh, um, I'm not quite sure exactly which period the sea started to appear on earth. Water. I mean, they don't even know how water came to be here. They seem to think it came uh, from meteorites or 
and life itself may have come from meteorites. There's still great debate, which is why geology is an, uh, a good thing to study, because not everybody knows all the answers yet. We're still learning the stuff being discovered and learned about, um, you know, and, and if you study it and, and learn about it, you may be the one that makes a, a new discovery that uh, changes the theories of everything that people have thought about geology and the life on Earth. Uh, so there's still a lot to learn. Now, when uh, you have periods of time uh, when creatures were were evolving, one of the earliest creatures that was was appearing on the Earth were tending to be uh, sort of uh, algaes and uh, things called stromatolites, which were sort of lumps that grew in warm, shallow seas. And they're, they're sort of a, an algae type, uh, lichen type thing, which built its body up layer by layer. And it's a very primitive sort of life. Now, those primitive sort of lives were, were st static. They didn't move about. But it wasn't long before creatures started to evolve, which uh, moved about the seas. And they used to float around. And one of those creatures I've got here, um, which... It's quite interesting, uh, and it, it, it's in a slate type material, which is uh, 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 a sedimentary rock. And you've probably all heard of slates that they use for uh, uh, putting on roofs and things. Now, those are all sedimentary rocks that are laid down that can be split and make roofing tiles, tiles and slates to go on roofs. But sometimes when you split open these layers between the... Uh, the rock, you come across creatures like this. Now I'm hoping this shows up well because they're quite shiny and they they look like a little stick uh, creature. It's uh, very strange and there was a great many of these and they're known as graptolites. Now they had a, a sort of a thicker end and a thinner end and a bit of a tail on the end there uh, and they were made up of multicellular creatures. In other words, they were a colony of creatures. They weren't just one creature. They were lots of little creatures living inside the, the segments of these stick-like appendages. And they would float about in the sea. Now, the earlier ones uh, were uh, like a mat and it looked like a cobweb. Very, And I've got some of those, but if I find them uh, as we go along, I'll, I'll bring them out and show them to you. But uh, these these and these are very important because these particular creatures, as they evolved, as one type of graptolite evolved, and in actual fact they call them graptolites because graphos is uh, Roman, I believe, or, or or Latin for writing. Because when they first discovered these, they looked like somebody's drawn on the rock, and so graptus is uh, sort of something to do with writing and that's why they call them graptolites but these creatures evolved and changed so you find these single ones and you find double ones and you find mats and layers and it seems that one type of graptolite died out giving over to a different type of graptolite so when you find these graptolites in rocks you can you can pretty well date the age of the rock by the graptolites that you find in it now of course not everywhere do you find graptolites. I mean, there is areas of Shropshire where you find graptolites. I found some, and I'll show them to you as we go on. This particular one, I think, uh, graptolite, it's it's an ore division graptolite, and it doesn't actually tell me on here where it comes from. And if you notice, I'm not going into great detail about the names of these creatures, only the basic name, because, A, they're very difficult. I mean, if on this piece of paper in here, you can see written the actual information about this particular rock and it's almost undecipherable. I mean, I can't even pronounce some of the words that are on it and I don't want to get them wrong. So if you want to know, as I say, about these uh, particular creatures, study them by all means and you can learn then the Latin names and how they, they actually said. But to me, I'm trying to make these videos as simple as possible. So I'm not going to include all the technical jargon at this stage, uh, partly because I can't remember it, to be honest, uh, and it isn't that important. The important thing is that you learn about uh, the actual creatures themselves. Now, one of the creatures that uh, 
I find I'm very fond of and I found quite a few of them in Shropshire uh, are uh, trilobites now we looked at a trilobite before from Morocco uh, in our travels and I've got some little specimens here of uh, trilobites which I've actually found in Shropshire uh, and I've got one here now one thing you'll notice <laughs> occasionally when I'm looking at these rocks I'll blow on them now that may seem that it's a bit of a silly thing to do and I, I may be look it may look as if I'm just blowing the dust off and, and in fact that's what I am doing but the other thing is when you blow a little bit of moisture comes out and goes onto the surface of the rock so geologists have this habit of <laughs> blowing on rocks uh, to, in, in, to, to actually enhance what you can see now if you look on that rock I'll put the light back on again. It may just help. I don't know. Get the light right. That's it. Now, if you look on that rock, you can see there's a little trilobite. Now, he's a complete trilobite. He's got his head, tail, and you can see the three lobes. Now, I've actually collected these trilobites. And one thing you can see about these trilobites is that they had quite a large head case at this end. And you can see the two eyes and a lot of them had feelers that came out either side so they can, uh, although they could see, they were in very muddy conditions so they needed feelers to find their way around. And that's quite a nice specimen of a trilobite uh, which I found. And you find lots of them in this black sediment and these are from the uh, South Shropshire area of, of where I live. And uh, that's that one. Now, there's another one, which is uh, only the head of a trilobite. And I'm hoping I can get the light in the right direction. Now, if you look at that one, the body part is missing, unfortunately, up here. But what I wanted you to look at on this particular specimen is the eyes. You see, there's two lumps on there, which are the eyes of a trilobite. And if you look at the eyes, they're exactly the same as the eyes you find on a fly. In other words, the eye was made up of tiny little lenses, lots and lots of them, probably hundreds, I don't know. So the, and the, the actual shape of the eye going round meant that this creature, when it was alive, could have a 365 degree view of its surroundings. And you can see it there with its two multifaceted eyes and also at the side, I don't know how well that shows up. Let's turn it that way. It had sort of feelers or extended pieces on either side of its head. And of course, it must have had a mouth underneath the front there somewhere. Now, that's one type of trilobite. And this here, maybe that same trilobite, is a, is a piece of its tail. Because as I told you, when the trilobites die, they fall apart. And so when you find them in rocks... This one is just a tiny fragment and that shows the tail of a trilobite and it had a little pointy tail. You can just make out the three lobes of the trilobite and his little tail. Now, that's what you find in trilobites. Now, here's another one. Give it a little blow in the hope that it'll get rid of the dust and show it up a little bit more. But this is another interesting trilobite which is found in Shropshire. And this one has the three lobes which you can see quite clearly but around the front I don't know how well it's showing up but I'm hoping it is there's a sort of beard we refer to that front bit as a beard and it's sort of a crescent it goes all the way around the front and that's sort of a bearded trilobite uh, so it's another species now apparently as I say there were probably hundreds of different types of trilobite evolved during the time when trilobites were around and again, by looking at those trilobites uh, and looking at them, you can you can date the rocks pretty precisely by the trilobites you find in it, as well as the graptolites. Now, another trilobite, while we're on the subject of trilobites, I'd like to show you this trilobite. And it's very special. Now, although I live in Shropshire, there's a town which is, uh, I, I'm not sure whether it is in Shropshire, I don't think it is, called Dudley. Uh, and you can look up on the geology on the, on the map to find out where Dudley is. Now, this is a trilobite that you find in Dudley. And it's very interesting. 
I've only got one of these and it's very similar to the Moroccan trilobite. It's got two little eyes at the front there and the three lobes. It hasn't got a beard which I just showed you but you can quite clearly see the mouth area and the eyes and the body. Now this particular one because it comes from Dudley it's known as the Dudley locust or the Dudley bug and uh, there's a famous area called the wren's nest I believe in Dudley where you can if you're lucky you can find these uh, trilobites I, I think because of a lot of people have been going there over the years and taken most of the specimens I think they frown on it a bit now if people go there digging uh, looking for the Dudley bug but it's world famous uh, and certainly the museums in Dudley will have specimens of the Dudley bug and I thought I'd show you that just for a little bit of fun uh, uh, it's uh, geologists especially people like me and we like a bit of a joke so Dudley bugs are, are very interesting now as we go on you'll see that uh, not only animals were evolving at this time but uh, creatures were starting to come out of the water. And of course, the reason they came out of the water was to find food. And the reason that was because uh, plants had started to grow on the surface of the earth. Uh, the atmosphere began to change and it was the plants that changed the atmosphere. Their photosynthesis of the sun were able to uh, change the atmosphere. And so many plants grew on the surface of the earth that it actually changed the atmosphere and produced more oxygen and that meant that the creatures that lived in the sea were able to breathe on dry land and they started to come out of the out of the sea and inhabit the land and eat the plants that were growing there now they were very strange plants not really like the plants we know today and i've got a couple of examples they were what they call cycads um, and they were very fern like type uh, plants there was probably more primitive ones earlier on but i haven't got examples of those but these sort of fern-like plants that grew up, and I've got a couple of examples of them here, which I'll show you. Now, incidentally, these plants are in, when these plants died, and they died in vast quantities, uh, and they lay down their own sediments. I mean, plants just grew on top of plants, and plants grew on top of plants. And after a while, you've got quite a bed or thickness, or a layer or sediment of, of plant life. Now, by tectonic plates and uh, movement of earth and goodness knows what erosion these plants got covered over in swamps and they got covered over in, to such a degree that they they sank down underneath the earth and were covered over and the pressure and heat and pressure changed those plants life into uh, minerals and this is one of them uh, they call it the carboniferous period because of what this and carbon is what this is um, I mean you make charcoal by burning uh, wood even today and that's a sort of a similar process but uh, you do it by keeping out the oxygen so that the uh, the the, the uh, material that you're carbonizing doesn't get any oxygen and, and burn away to dust it stays as a hard material which we call charcoal and various things but this is actually a piece of coal and coal is formed in the very same way by uh, sedimentary rocks of trees and creatures that lived in those uh, forests and uh, being crushed down and flattened and forming coal seams. Now we harvest those coal seams and, and burn the coal for fuel. It's one of the fossil fuels. But on the outskirts of these uh, materials, when you split them open occasionally, if you're lucky, and I've got an example here of it, you'll find the remains of fossilized plants. Now again, I don't know how accurate this is going to be to show but if you look very carefully on there you can just see there is the remains of the bark of one of these cycads the imprint of it in that piece of coal now I've got another one here and this is a slightly different plant and on this one it almost looks like skin of a dinosaur or something but it looks like knobbly bubbly and this is actually the skin or the outer casing of a plant, a cycad, in the coal. Now, I don't know how well you're going to be able to see it. Now, I haven't got a lot of these. I've got a few uh, different fossils of uh, plant life. 
But I brought these two in to show you today, and I may show you more as we go on. But that, I hope, shows up. But that's plant life. And of course, there were smaller leaf-like creatures, uh, leaf-like plants in those forests. And this one is in a different kind of material. It's not coal, but I don't know whether you can see it. Let's try and get it as close to the camera as possible and turn it round. This is what's known as a seed fern. As I say, these fern-like plants were growing in these primeval swamps in the Carboniferous period. And you can see there's plants like that that have leaves just like that alive today. And this was uh, a plant that grew many, many millions of years ago. And it's wonderful to be able to still see it. And it's what's known as a seed fern. Now then, I think I've just about exhausted all the uh, specimens that I've got here. Now, we've gone on for quite some time with this video, so I don't want to go on too long and bore everybody. But uh, this has been another, the second in my series of videos, which I'm hoping to do on geology. And uh, I'll dig out a few more specimens and try and make it as interesting as possible to look at. And we'll look at some more minerals. I'm hoping to do a field trip and that will be exciting. We'll actually go out into the field and uh, look at some of the uh, areas in South Shropshire where uh, minerals are. And we'll have a look at the, uh, the old state of some of the mines and different places. And so that will be the subject of another video. But for today, I think we'll call it quits and uh, I'll uh, cut this video off now. And uh, hopefully you found it interesting and you've learned something and you've been encouraged to go out and look for rocks yourself. So it's Grandad saying bye for now and I'll see you next time. Bye now.